But before we actually start, um, let's think about what components our game actually consists of so that we know what classes uh, to define. Um, so let me open up my notes here. And we're going to use these sound effects later, but uh, for now, let's see. Um, so what do we have going on here? Um, we have what I would call a tennis court, um, which basically consists of these walls here. And it also is where the actual game takes place. So the court basically contains the ball and the two paddles. Um, so we have a tennis court. That would be one class. We have a paddle class that describes, well, the controllable paddle, um, be it by uh, user input or by an AI. And we have a tennis ball. And that's pretty much it for the major components. Oh, there's one more, a scoreboard. We also want a class that describes, well, a scoreboard that renders the current score of both players as well as the current round and stuff like that. And those are the key components of our game. Um, there's actually one class that I also want to create, which is a rectangle class, just as a helper um, to help us deal with collision detection and stuff like that later on. So I'm going to go ahead now and create a new class down here. And the class is called rectangle. And let's create a constructor for initializing instances of this class. Um, and we're going to need a position for the rectangle and a width and a height. Now, we're going to set some properties here to those um, parameter values. And this time, uh, those fields are not uh, private. They're actual, actually public properties. And we can actually uh, implement these properties. Um, we can actually implement custom getters and setters for properties in JavaScript uh, using this syntax here. For example, we should we could say uh, a property named left, and that would return the um, x field. Um, so basically, let's say we have a rectangle here, there. Let's say we have a rectangle here, left would be um, the, yeah, the position, the x uh, the X component of the rectangle's position, meaning this part of the rectangle. And let's also do that for the right side of the rectangle, which would be X plus its width, which, was, which would give us the X coordinate of the right-hand side of the rectangle. And since these are properties, we can just use them uh, outside of the class uh, like this. Um, this would then return the value of this property. And in this case here for the right property, it is a calculated value. It doesn't return directly the value of a field. Instead, um, some logic is applied. Uh, let's also do that for top, which will just be the y coordinate of the rectangle and bottom, which will be the y coordinate plus the height. So this would be top, uh, the, y, the y coordinate of the top part here, and this would be bottom. Okay, and now we need a method for checking if two rectangles overlap. This will help us with the collision detection later on. So let's create a method here and call it overlaps. Um, and it's going to take an argument 
let's call it other and that's going to be the other instance of rectangle for which we want to check if they overlap and it's just going to return a boolean expression here um, let me just go ahead here and then explain afterwards There we go. And if you take a look at this, uh, this is actually a safe way to check if two rectangles overlap. So let's say here, if the left hand side of the other uh, rectangle is less than the right hand side of this rectangle, meaning let's say, let's go here and let's put another rectangle here. like this Oops. and let's take a look at the code again so the left hand side of the other left uh, rectangle is smaller than the right hand side of this rectangle that would be true in this case this is the left hand side of the other this is the right hand side of this rectangle now also let's check is the left hand side of this rectangle smaller than the right hand side of the other rectangle? Yes, it is. Left hand side of this, right hand side of the other one. And the same applies to bottom and top. If the top uh, property of the other rectangle is smaller than the bottom of this one, which it is, top is smaller than bottom, And yeah, you get the idea. So this way we can make sure to check for an overlap between rectangles. And now we also may want to check if a certain point is contained in this instance of the rectangle. So let's create a method here with two parameters, X and Y, which will be the, the point that we want to check if it is in that rectangle. And we'll return This is actually fairly obvious. So if the left hand side is smaller than X and the right hand side is greater than X, then obviously X must be somewhere between these two sides. So for example here, and for Y, is also valid. Great. So this class will help us later. Um, for now, let's keep it like this. And let's take a look at the court class, which describes our tennis court where the game takes place. All right, so maybe let's go down here directly under the tennis game class and to find a new class and call it court. It's going to need a constructor as well. And it's going to take an instance of canvas, a reference to the canvas element, because we need that for rendering stuff. And we're going to store this simply in a private field, like this. And for now, since we haven't created the other classes yet for the paddle and the ball and stuff, I think this is it. Uh, we can take care of the rest later. Yeah, should be fine. Um, now let's create an update method here that we can call repeatedly. Pass in the delta time as an argument. And for now, let's add a comment here that we still need to do this. Um, we're going to need regular updates for the court, but we don't need to implement that right now. Let's just implement a draw method here, which will be responsible for actually rendering the court to the screen. Now 
And I'm going to take the canvas as an argument. And a canvas element has a method named getContext. And we can use this context object to render stuff to the canvas. So we create a, context, a 2D context for rendering, well, 2D stuff. So we're not going to render 3D polygons, models, stuff like that. Uh, it's going to be strictly two-dimensional. And with this context object that we got from the canvas, which is passed in here as, a, as an argument, uh, with this context object, we can actually now draw stuff. Um, and well, in order to draw like the walls and stuff, we need to define the color of the walls. We need to define the, the thickness of the walls. And as you can see, also there's a slight margin here. So the walls are not directly at the top here of the screen. Um, so we need to define the, those values, the thickness, the margin, color, stuff like that. And let's use our game settings object for that to add some more constants. So, for example, we need to define the color of the walls. So, let's add a property here, wall color. Whoops, wall color. And you can simply use a hexadecimal uh, um, representation of the color as you would in uh, CSS. And let's go with 202020. 20. So the R part, the red part is 20. The, the G part, the green part is also 20. And the blue part also 20. And that should give us a nice gray color. Um, let's also define here the size of the wall. Let's say 20 pixels. And what else? Uh, we need the margin. Let's say the margin is, well, let's actually say chord margin X is 12. And let's also define a margin on the vertical axis, which would be four. That should be fine. And I think that's all we need for now. So let's go back into the court class in the draw method down here. And first thing we're going to do is say, set the fill style, whoops, fill style property of the context, the rendering context to that wall color property of our constant game settings object. And now we can actually draw a rectangle using the function fill rect of the context object. Um, now the first parameter is going to be the start position, which is going to be, I mean, the X component of the start position, which is zero. And the Y component of the start position, the upper left corner of the rectangle uh, will be the margin, the vertical margin that we just defined. And the width will be the width of the entire canvas. How do we get it? Well, we, we do have it as a field. We also have it as a parameter here. It's kind of redundant, but it's fine. And the uh, height is going to be game settings dot wall size. There. So now you can see it as one line. Uh, but I'm going to readjust this. Okay. That's going it's it's it looks a little messy, but that's fine. And we need to also draw the other wall, right? Uh, so let's do the same thing here. Fill rect. And the X component 
of the start position is zero. And what is the Y position? Well, that's the canvas height minus the chord margin Y and also minus the size of the wall. Width and height will be the same for this wall. The canvas width and the wall size. There we go, this should take care of that. And I think for now this should be fine. But this draw method is never called, so let's take care of that now. All right, so let's go into our tennis game class. And in the constructor, the first thing that we want to do is create an instance of court and pass in the canvas to the constructor of the court class. Now we have an instance that we can work with. And let's see. Um, our tennis game class itself also needs a draw method uh, that we can call uh, in order to draw everything that is in the game. So the draw method will take care of drawing everything that is drawable, renderable. Um, so we're going to do the same thing as we did before and get an instance of context, which we can get from the canvas field. I'm going to pass in the string literal 2D to get a two-dimensional rendering context. And what we want to do every frame is actually clear the screen. Because if we don't, um, everything that we rendered in the previous frame will still be on the screen. So that's why we want to call the clear rect method ctx dot clear rect and now we need to define the dimensions the position and dimensions of the rectangle which we want to clear um, so we have to pass that as arguments here x and y will be zero zero which is the upper left corner um, and then we want to clear the entire width and height of the canvas. Just to make sure the screen gets cleared before everything is drawn, or redrawn to the screen. All right, now we want to, after that, we want to actually draw our court using its draw method. And we can pass in our canvas. So that's done. But this draw method of the tennis game class of the uh, tennis game instance is also never called and we actually want to render each frame so we're going to go here in our run method and in our run method we're going to go into our anonymous function here and after calling update to update the game logic we're going to call draw and I'm going to save this now and let's see, let's go here, let's clear the console. Let me hit run. Okay, and now if I if I didn't make any mistakes, if we start the game now, we should see the walls. Yep, there they are. And we're still uh, logging uh, the delta time to the console. Let's get rid of that because it really clutters the console and we don't need that anymore. So I'm going to go here, remove this save again and it stopped I'm going to clear the console perfect okay so the next thing i want to do is go back to uh here into the court class and i'm going to add a property um a getter only a read only property where the returned value is actually calculated uh, and that's going to be the bounce uh, of the of the court, meaning basically the entire space where the actual game takes place. So this space here. So the upper bound would be here, the uh, bottom edge of the uh, top wall, 
and the lower bound would be the upper edge of the yeah wall at the bottom here and yeah we're simply going to return here a JSON object with a few properties upper which is the chord margin y plus the wall size this should give us the upper boundary of the uh, chord and then the lower boundary which would be the height of the canvas minus the chord margin whoops ah. plus uh, the wall size again I could also instead of going uh, using parentheses here uh, uh, and a plus operator I could also get rid of the parentheses and just use a minus operator here that would be the same thing so the chord margin down here plus the wall size if I subtract that the sum of the, uh, these two values I get the lower boundary of the chord okay so now uh, the left boundary is simply zero. It's directly here at the edge of the screen. And the right boundary will be simply the full canvas width. And we'll just return that as an object. And this is going to help us later um, for checking if like uh, yeah if the the ball and the paddle to, to keep them within the bounds of the game basically yeah and I think we can already go ahead and create the paddle class which describes well the paddle um, of the player and the CPU uh, opponent so let's go down here uh, maybe directly over the rectangle class Seems like a fine place for this. Yeah, that's fine. So let's say class paddle. And hold on, we need one thing. Um, we need to be able to specify if that paddle uh, belongs to the left player or the right player. So we need some sort of index to indicate um, who this paddle belongs to so that we know what color to render it with and stuff like that. Um, so let's go ahead and actually create an object up here. Um, yeah, let's go directly up here and say constant uh, player index. And JavaScript doesn't have enums, so uh, Another way to have like a set of constants, a uh, set of predefined constants is to just use like a constant object like this and give that uh, object um, basically a couple of properties which represent the different states of the enumeration. It's kind of like a pseudo uh, enum uh, sort of thing. So we're going to have two properties, player one and player two. Player one will have the value one and player two will have the value two. And now in the paddle class, let's create a constructor which takes in a few arguments. The first one being the X component of the position at which to render the paddle. And of course we also need a Y component. Uh, it needs a width and a height. And then we need to uh, need a way to specify the index, uh, either player one or player two, and we need a reference to the court. 
because we're going to need the boundaries and stuff. So let's actually initialize the properties. Position x is going to be plus x, plus y equals plus y, width equals width, height equals height, player index equals player index. And uh, here in this case, I'm going to use a private field because the player index is really not important uh, from the outside of the class. Uh, also a private field for the court. And also we want to remember the start position so that we can reset the position later. So we're going to remember what the original position was in the constructor here and store it in a field. And we can actually already go ahead and use that, create a reset method, which we can use to reset the position. So we're simply going to say this plus x equals this start plus x, this plus y equals this start, whoops, start plus y in order to reset the position. We're going to use that later. And now we need a couple of methods here as well. Um, let's add a static property, which only has a getter and it's named speed. And this will basically define, well, not basically, we'll define um, the pixels per second, the speed in pixels per second at which this pedal can move. And it's static because it's not, uh, well, there are no class level uh, constants in JavaScript, um, but there are static properties. So we're going to uh, uh, create a static property that is on class level. So it's not on instance level. Um, it's shared between instances, so to speak, um, to return like a constant value that each pedal uh, will use for its speed. Okay. And let's create another property called collision box. And we will use that later for collision detection. And what collision bo box returns is an instance of our rectangle class. That's why we created that earlier. So, so basically we need to um, return the axis aligned uh, boundary box of that paddle to check for collisions later on. So the X position of the pedal is of the of this uh, rectangle is actually the x position of this pedal same for the y position and actually the same for width and height there we go so we now have a property that gives us a rectangle uh, with the boundaries of the pedal Mm, and now we also need a way to render this paddle to the screen. So let's say draw. And we need something to draw onto. So let's take canvas, the canvas as a uh, argument. And I just realized that I accidentally defined this outside of the class. Sorry. There. So uh, uh, of course the draw method is a part of a member of the pedal class and yeah how do we render this pedal well it's basically also just a rectangle uh, on the screen um, a vertical rectangle that is either rendered in red or in blue depending on which player controls it the left one is going to be rendered uh, in the color red and the right one is going to be color uh, going to be the color blue um, so let's actually create, before we implement the draw method, let's create another property and call that render color. And that will return the color to use for rendering the paddle. And we can simply return, uh, we can use uh, a ternary, the ternary uh, operator here. Uh, let's say player index. So if the player index equals 
player one, the property value of that constant object. Then we want to uh, return red. Oops, no comma. Otherwise, we want to return blue. But I don't like to use literals here. Let's define those values as constants in our game settings object here. And actually, mm, here, player one color. Uh, actually, you can also use a few colors have an actual name that you can use uh, an expressive uh, name like red. So just like in CSS, uh, you can do the same thing here. Uh, as I did here for background, I just type dark green. And uh, yeah, there are a few named colors and uh, where yeah, you can actually address them by name. So for player two, we're going to use blue. And let's go back into the uh, render color property of the paddle class. And then here, if the player index is player one, then we're going to return game settings, player one color. Ah, why, why do I keep typing a comma? Game settings dot player two color. And that should do the trick. Yep. And now we can use this render color property to get the correct color uh, with which to draw the paddle. So let's go ahead and again, get an instance of context using the canvas. There we go. And now, again, use the fill style property to set the render color. And we're going to use the render, uh, the render color property of this petal instance. And then we're going to fill a rectangle using the position and the dimensions of this petal as well here. There we go. And this should allow us to draw the instance of petal to the screen. Uh, let's see what else. Well, we need to be able to move the paddle up and down. Uh, we can use a, a button or key, keyboard input uh, for that, or we can use like an AI for that, um, depending on which player it is. Um, but what we do know in, in any case, in either case, is that we need a way to move the paddle. So let's create a method, move up, and we're going to pass the delta time, the duration of one frame as a argument because we need that to scale the the movement um, so to make it frame rate independent so that we don't move um, one pixel or I don't know five pixels uh, per frame but rather five pixels per second um, so it's time based instead of frame based so uh, what happens when we move up? Well, actually we decrease the position because remember the um, coordinate system basically starts at the upper left corner and goes down to the lower right corner. So we're going to decrease the position here by the speed, the static speed property, which is 150 pixels and multiply that by delta time to scale it. And if we've reached the top, we can no longer move. So if the position is lower than the upper bound, the upper boundary of the court, then we're going to set it back to the upper bound, upper boundary. Oops. So once we've reached the upper wall here, um, we will stop the pedal from moving even further. And we're going to need the same thing 
for moving down. So I'm just going to copy this method here, paste it, realign it a little, and call it move down. And that will do the exact opposite. It will increase the position, the Y position. And once it is, uh, if the Y position plus the height, so the lower edge of the pedal is greater than the lower bound, we will set the position to the lower bound minus the height of the pedal because the position is basically the upper left corner of the pedal. And that should do the trick. And I think that's it for the pedal class. Um, because the controls of the pedal class are actually the pedal the pedal instance doesn't care, shouldn't care about how it is controlled. Um, we're going to implement a separate class um, which then controls the pedal instance. And actually there's going to be two different controller classes. One that uses player in input and one that uses an AI. So, but for now, let's test our pedal. Um, the pedal is part of the court. So we're going to go into the court class in the constructor and we're going to create an instance of pedal. I'm going to name it left pedal. It's going to be an instance of pedal. And since the constructor is kind of long, I'm going to actually use multiple lines here. And for the first argument, which is the Whoops, what was the first argument again? That's the, oh, the position. And I'm actually going to just use the, uh, well, let's go, let's, let's think. Ah, uh, let's actually define the dimensions of the pedal in, uh, as a constant also here in the settings. So let's go ahead and say, uh, let's go here and say pedal width and let's say 12 and for the pedal height, I'm going to say 48 and that's it for now. And actually what I'm going to do here in the court constructor um, for the first parameter, the position, I'm just going to say game settings pedal width. So it's going to be the X position is going to be its exact width. So it so it has basically one pedal would fit next to it. Mm. Then for the Y position, I guess we simply take the canvas, get its height and divide that by two to get the center and then also uh, subtract whoops the pedal height divided by 2 because remember the uh, position of the pedal is its upper left corner so we need to also yeah factor in half its height to actually center it Mm, and then the width and the height will actually be pedal width. Oh, I forgot a comma here, there. Pedal height. Uh, the index, the left pedal will have the player index player one. And then we need an, uh, a reference to a court instance, which is actually this one here. And now we have um, an instance of pedal uh, stored in a field named left pedal. And I'm actually going to um, create a getter for that property. I'm going to add a property here, left pedal. And it's just simply going to return the value of the left pedal field. And the reason I do that is so that it's accessible from the outside of the class, but only, uh, but but read only. 
so that we, we have a getter, but we don't have a setter. Since it's JavaScript, it's a dynamically typed language, uh, there's actually nothing that uh, prohibits us from setting uh, the left pedal field outside of the class. But uh, like I said, it's a convention uh, to use like an underscore to indicate that this is actually a private field. But we now expose a public uh, property, um, which only exposes a getter uh, to get the value of that private field. Now, let's see, in the draw method, we would now like to actually draw the pedal. After drawing the walls, we're simply going to go ahead and say this left pedal, or you can also use the, um, the property, meaning spelling it without an underscore. Call the draw method, and the, remember the draw method takes an instance of canvas, so we're going to pass the canvas here. And that should do the trick. Let's save. Clear the console. Minimize it. Save again. Run. Start the game. And there we have it. It's exactly in the center here because we factored in it's half its height and stuff. The space here is exactly the width of one pedal, and I think that's fine. We could have also used the margin, uh, but whatever. Um, yeah, and we're going to need that on the other side as well, but in another color. Um, but yeah, so far so good.